السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على نبيه الذي اصطفى نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهدى أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وذكرهم بأيام الله سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم The verse that I read in the beginning of the speech is from chapter 14, Surah Ibrahim, verse 5, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam to remind them of the days and the glories of Allah that he bestowed upon the Israelites. This is something natural in human beings, that people remember the days of old. They remember the days when they were kids. They remember the days when they were young. They remember the days of their life. They remember human nature is to remember the days that they were happy and joyful in. So Allah is tapping into his creation's instincts that he put in them when he created them. Also in Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when he created the system of the heavens and the earth, there were four months that were selected. And those were the sacred months. Three of them are Sard and one of them is Fard. Sard means they are back to back which is Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hajjah, and then Muharram, right? The month before the month of Hajj, the month of pilgrimage, Hajj, Dhul Hijjah, and then Muharram, the beginning of the new year. And then Fard is one which is an outlier, which is alone, which is Rajab, which precedes Sha'ban, and then Ramadan. Some of the Tabi'een, they used to say that the month of Rajab is like a cool wind, and Sha'ban is like rain, and then Ramadan is like when the vegetation grows out from the ground so is it true that month of rajab there is nothing sacred or nothing of the prophet's practice associated with that is it true that anybody who attempts to do any worship in this month uh, is that an innovation it is a bid'ah see unfortunately one of the challenges that we deal with in the muslim community in the united states is there is a very big disconnect between them and their traditions that are sacred and that are with a sound chain of narration with Isnad. There was a survey uh, done by the University of Georgia by imams. 300 imams were selected from major two organizations in the U.S. And 100 imams were approached. Only 70 of them responded to the survey. The rest of them had what they call academic phobia. They were afraid that if they answer those questions, you know, they will be labeled or they will be, uh, you know, uh, somehow compromised in their personal information. The survey has many informa informative pieces. One of the most important things that caught my attention is that when you look at the imams in one of these major states from which the survey was done, which were very highly populated with Muslims, only 10% of the imams actually follow a madhab. They only follow a madhab. The rest of the 5% are what they call uh, free for all. You know, I can just open the Quran and book of Hadith and decide whatever I want. And the rest of the 80 plus percent were basically people who would not conform to any madhab uh, and they would try to pick and choose whatever they felt is appropriate according to the time. So is it true that if you follow a madhab, like here's a question that usually is being asked all the time, randomly and you know and we will you know segue we will answer this question and then then we will segue into rajab and then we'll end the discussion right some people say is it okay to follow a madhab or is it not enough to follow the quran and sunnah see the question in itself is inappropriate is inaccurate why because it gives the impression that as if the madhab is something that is distant and it is not something associated with the Qur'an and Sunnah. So for that person, here's a question for you. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was alive, right, in the pilgrimage of, uh, his pilgrimage, uh, of the last pilgrimage and the only pilgrimage, how many Sahaba were present there? 124,000. And when the Sahaba were alive in the time of the Prophet when the Qur'an was coming, they actually had memorized the Qur'an. And how many of those Sahaba who memorized the Qur'an would interpret the Qur'an on their own or would they go to the, to the Prophet 
Obviously, the Sahaba would go to the Prophet ﷺ, even though they did not have anything called a book, like, you know, a, 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 a book that is printed in the Quran or written with the hand. They would keep it in their home, but they would memorize it. They would, even with their memory of the Quran, they would still go to the Prophet and ask him about the issues. So there was no Sahabi who was sitting down at home and he said, I memorized the Quran. I really don't need the Prophet's interpretation. I can interpret on my own although they were Arabs. Similarly, when the Sahaba were sent to other distant areas like Yemen, in the south and in the north, the Prophet ﷺ would send them as a teacher. He would not say just, hey, here's a copy of the Quran, whatever you memorized, scribe it, and then go and you know give them the copy and come back. No, he would send them as a teacher. So this teaching was associated with the Nabi ﷺ. So therefore, at the time of the Prophet, there was only one madhab. And that madhab was the madhab of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But then, on the day of the pilgrimage, there was 124,000 madhahib because the religion was completed and all those sahaba were trained students of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then those sahaba, they went and in the time of the tabi'een, they would teach the Qur'an. No, no tabi'i would ever say, hey, tell me by the way, um, why did the Prophet do this? Obviously, they would ask them. It was never a question when the Tabi'een would not ask the Sahaba. So this is how the link was established from the Nabi, right, to the Sahabi, to the Tabi'i. And that's why we have Isnad. The teaching actually comes down through the ages, through teacher, from teacher, to teacher, to the student. And that is why it is very important to follow the traditional normative method of gaining knowledge and not the method which is totally disrupted, disruptive uh, for the intellectual pursuit of sacred knowledge. So yes, madhab is something which is the Qur'an and Sunnah. It is not something different. It is Qur'an and Sunnah. It is the embodiment of the Qur'an and Sunnah, and it has enough flexibility built into it that actually accommodates the differences of people from region to region, country to country, tradition to tradition, culture to culture, and that error correction is already built in. Just like in all of our devices, we have error correction built in. In the compasses, the digital devices, in the computers, in the Wi-Fi signals, in the clocks, there is an error correction that is built in. Like today is February, soon in March, the clock will change. The computers already have that error correction built in. As soon as that time change takes place, you will not have to uh, fix your computer. The computer will automatically adjust. Similarly, the madhab is the same thing. The madhab is the same thing. So the question, if somebody asks, should I follow a madhab or should I follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, ask him how many sahaba who will memorize the Qur'an, right, in the time of the Prophet, never consulted the Prophet. They always consulted the Prophet, even if they knew the verse. And one example is when one of these sahaba, who was sitting in the time of dawn before Ramadan, he was looking at two threads, black and white, and the Prophet told him, it is not these threads that the Qur'an is referring to, it doesn't mean that you're looking at two threads and visually you can see them because of the sunlight hitting them. He said it means the dawn and the darkness of the night. So therefore, madhab is imperative. Now this actually gives us a segue into Rajab. If somebody says, hey, give me one authentic tradition about Rajab, there are many authentic traditions. Like one of the traditions in Sahih Muslim is hadith number 1157C. Right? If you go to the MSA Sunnah website.com, you'll see 1157C. And the hadith is by Sa'id bin Jubair, who is a tabi'i, who narrates that I heard Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, who is the cousin of the Prophet. He said that the Prophet used to fast in Rajab so much that we thought that he's never going to break his fast. Similarly, he would never not fast, and we would think that he would never going to fast. He's never going to fast. So that meant that the Prophet did want did not want or intend to make Rajab exclusive with fasting and he did not want it to be totally singled out for fasting. He would fast to the point that was important to show the importance, right? And then also he would not fast to give the message to the Sahaba that, you know, it is not mandatory. It is up to you to do whatever you want in this month based on your preference. So the doors of goodness is open. Now, what is the month of Rajab? First of all, it is a sacred month. So it's mentioned indirectly in the Quran. 
Second of all, what is the meaning of the word Rajab? The, the word Rajab means Tarjibu Shay. Tarjibu Shay in Arabic means to glorify something. And in the time of the pagans, in the time of Quraysh, they used to not fight in this month out of the glorification. And they would also sacrifice a lamb to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month. That was their tradition. And they used to call it Al-Atira. Atira meaning a sacrifice of a lamb. So, after we understand the word Rajab means to glorify something, right? We understand that there is something in this month that is different. And that's why Allah glorified it by saying it is sacred. فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah says all these four months that are sacred, do not oppress yourself by committing sin. So that is one injunction immediately that we should not sin in this month and try to be as clean as possible, at least in these four months, right? Now, Imam Shafi'i, radiallahu an, he actually, in his sunnah, he says it is a mustahab and preferred that a person actually sacrifices a lamb in the month of Rajab. This is in the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. Therefore, if you go countries like Egypt or you go to in countries like Malaysia, these traditions and with traditional scholars are very alive till this day. The scholars go and sacrifice a lamb. Now, there's a difference of opinion on this because the ulama looked at all the ahadith. So Imam Shafi'i chose the opinion that it is actually preferred to sacrifice a lamb. Some ulama say it is actually not preferred. That's the second opinion. You can do it or you don't do it, doesn't matter. And then the third one, which is the very restrictive opinion, uh, right? And that is that it is actually not even worth it. It used to be practiced by the Arabs and the old or the pagans. Therefore, we should not try to emulate them. And that is the traditional opinion that is pronounced in the media to the extent that people say, don't do anything in Rajab. It is just a normal month. It's not a normal month. It is a sacred month. See, so in this discussion, these subtleties get lost. So if the Prophet ﷺ fasted, if somebody wants to fast, we say it's okay. Like Imam Shafi'i also says that we learn from our teachers, it has been told to us, that the first night of Rajab, right, it, the du'as are accepted and we discuss that. So if somebody took advantage of that, no problem. And in the same discussion, Imam Shafi'i says, I never say it is obligation, I say that I heard it from my teachers. And for me, that is good enough. What is the other thing? Now some people get caught up into what they call the, uh, the, the nitty-gritty of this innovation, not innovation, is it bid'ah or no bid'ah? They're concerned that the ummah will somehow make a big giant mistake if they consider the 27th of Rajab the day of Isra and Mi'raj. The day of Isra and Mi'raj. Now is it a coincidence that the month, which is the seventh month of the year, of the lunar year, is Rajab? And in this month, the journey of the seven heavens took place? You see the correlation? This is the seventh month, seventh month of the lunar calendar. And in this month, Allah took His Prophet ﷺ to the journey of the seven heavens in Isra and Mi'raj, the night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem to the seven heavens, which is the ascension. So the night journey and ascension, Isra and Mi'raj. Right? So let's say if somebody says we will discuss Isra and Mi'raj, and we will talk about it in the month of Rajab. Immediately, some people consider or think, oh my God, this must be an innovation because the Prophet never did that. Well, the Prophet never did that, right? But the Quran says, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Oh Musa, remind them of the days of the glory. So if you look at the Mufassirin and the people who did the explanation of the Quran, there are two opinions about this. What does this mean? وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ And remind them of the days of Allah. That is the literal translation. One group of scholars says that means the bounties of Allah, the physical bounties of Allah. And the other ones, they say it actually means the occasion, the time frame, the history. Just like the people say, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ Arab, Remind them of the days old of the Arabs. You know, this is actually something which is common in all cultures. Right? Even in the English culture, they say, remind them of the days of glory of old of the knights who rode the horses. I mean, this is human nature. So people cannot come out and now start to defy human nature. So what we are doing is we're not actually trying to identify what day that journey took place because that is something 
that is not exactly and precisely known. But what we're trying to do is not celebrate that day, but we're commemorating the, the occasion, the occasion and this glorious event, the event in which Allah pro- took the Prophet Sallallahu to a journey that is unlike any other journey. Now, if somebody says, okay, what does that journey mean? For a person who is a person who ta- reads about quantum physics, right? We can tell them very easily from my perspective, this is my opinion, my perspective. Of course, I've crossed, checked it with scholars who've authorized. Is that this is a journey in which one human being from the history of humanity witnessed what they call the quantum singularity. Now, some people might say, oh my God, the imam has gone mad. What is this quantum singularity? Meaning that the Prophet ﷺ went beyond the last point of creation, which is Sidratul Muntaha, right? And he actually witnessed, right, universes in existence. He saw people of hell in hell being punished. He saw people of heaven in heaven. Bilal radiallahu anhu was in Mecca sleeping. But he heard the footsteps of Bilal in Jannah. Multidimensional, quantum existence, singularity in which Allah created everything and all the possibilities of all the worlds. Yes, if the person is scientific, he will appreciate what I'm saying. So yes, in this month, we should try to do the first injunction of the Quran. فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not oppress yourself. Number two, if you want to fast, no problem. You're fasting Monday, Thursday, it's fine. You, you want to fast uh, 13, 14, 15, no problem. You want to fast more than that, no problem. But don't make it an exclusive fast. I'm going to fast all the month because that's not something the Prophet Sallallahu gave advice on. Similarly, if you want to teach your children about the ascension journey, about Isra and Mi'raj, no problem. And finally, my humble request, the Muslims in the United States are suffering tremendously because they lack sacred knowledge because they think it is as easy as picking up a book of physics and discussing it. It is not like that, folks. Even if a person is registered in a course in the university, he will never dare to open the book and interpret and skip chapters while the professor is in charge and watching, and he has a curriculum and a lesson plan that he has given, or the compact that he has given to the students in the beginning of the class. So with that, inshallah, I leave you in the blessings of the holy month of Rajab, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of us and elevate our ranks. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.